All right, so we're gonna give it, get started here now. Um, we'll see everybody pops in um, shortly or we'll continue to file in to join us this morning. Hello from rainy central Pennsylvania. Hope you're having better weather where you are on this Saturday morning. Um, my name is Matt Point and I am the Director of Advancement here at Children with Diabetes. Thank you so much for joining us for Friends for Life Fall 2021, a week of virtual celebration. As you know, tomorrow is our last day and the big day of celebration. So please make sure you check out all of our fun World Diabetes Day activities we have tomorrow. As a friendly reminder, you can ask any questions you want throughout the presentation by dropping them into the chat. At the end, I'm going to pop back up um, and I will facilitate asking the questions you have if you'd like to have ask them anonymously, you can send them directly to me through the chat, or you can drop them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and choose to send them anonymously, and we will get all of your questions answered, if possible, at the end of the, um, at the, end of the presentation. So once again, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here this week. We truly appreciate it. And now um, I have the pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Daniel DeSalvo, or as Dr. Dan, as his patients call him. He's a pediatric endocrinologist at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital, where he serves as the Director of Strategic Collabor Collaboratives. As a sophomore at Baylor University, his life changed forever when he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which ultimately directed his career path. After graduating from Texas A&M College of Medicine, he completed pediatric residency at the George Washington University School of Medicine, where he was appointed chief resident, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric endocrinology at Stanford University. Now, as a pediatric endocrinologist, his greatest passion is helping others live well with diabetes, and he considers it a remarkable privilege to shepherd families on their diabetes journey. He currently serves on the T1D Exchange Quality Improvement Collaborative, Beyond Type 1 Scientific Advisory Council, and College Diabetes Network Clinical Research Advisory Committee. As a patient-oriented clinical researcher, his primary focus is on emerging diabetes technology, including closed-loop automated insulin delivery systems. Dr. Dan enjoys an active life, which includes running, cycling, swimming, skiing, hiking, and playing sports with his two young boys. Dr. Dan, thanks for being here with us today. Matt, thank you so much for that great introduction. Good to be with all of you. Um, really a privilege. It is a beautiful day in Houston, Texas, where I live. It's like 65 degrees and warm and sunny. So hope it's the same wherever you guys are who are uh, listening in today. So let's go ahead and get started. A couple of disclosures for me. I serve as an independent consultant for Dexcom and Insulet, who makes the Omnipod pump. And then I have received research support from Dexcom and Medtronic and Insulet. So Matt sort of walked you through a little bit of my personal journey. And the year Y2K, I was a sophomore at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And that really is what changed my career trajectory. I was actually a political science major and had this epiphany where I realized I really want to be a doctor for kids with diabetes, not realizing the path that laid ahead with pediatric endocrinology training and fellowship, but uh, it's been an incredible joy to be on that journey. I did my pediatric residency at Children's National Medical Center at the George Washington University School of Medicine. And it was during that time that I was first introduced to this idea of closed loop automated insulin delivery systems while I was doing a advocacy internship with the JDRF. And through that experience, I met Dr. Bruce Buckingham, who's been an amazing mentor, colleague, and friend. And he was my research mentor at Stanford University, where I did my postdoc fellowship training. And then six years ago in 2015, I came back home to Texas, and I've been in Houston ever since, practicing at Texas Children's Hospital and on faculty at Baylor College of Medicine. So as a way of goals and objectives for today, we're going to go beyond A1C to review CGM-derived glucose metrics. I'll provide an overview of closed-loop systems, what they are, what they can and cannot do. We're going to review something called the Keras paradigm, which is really meant to be a practical guide for understanding different closed-loop systems. And then we're really going to hit some highlights with clinical pearls for making the most of your closed-loop system or your child's closed-loop system. So let's start with this. This is a great figure that Adam Brown, who's a science writer for Diatribe Foundation, wrote. And if you take a look at this, this is 12 a.m., this is noon, this is the afternoon and evening time. And this is person number one, 
person number two and person number three with diabetes. This is their average glucose by time of day. And from your homes, you can do it on your finger. You can put it in the chat if you're willing. But I want you to think about who has the lowest A1C if this is average glucose by patient number one, number two, and number three. And it looks like I accidentally forwarded too soon because this is actually a trick question. These are the many faces of an A1C of 7%. Now, each of these patients had an average glucose of 154 milligrams per deciliter. That's an A1C of 7%, but the lived experience was completely different for patient number one or person number one who had just 18% of the values in the range of 70 to 180 with 24% below 70 milligrams per deciliter, while person number three had 100% time and range. So I think it's important to go beyond A1C to think about glucose metrics like time and range, time below range, time above range, and just recently, I mentored a couple of our fellows at Baylor Texas Children's, and we published this in Diabetes Spectrum, this practical guide for interpreting and optimizing continuous glucose data in youth with diabetes. And the goal is to aim for narrow, what, what I call flat, narrow, in range, FNIR. It's a term that Kelly Close from Close Concerns has used a lot when it comes to glucose management and type 1 diabetes. But that is not easy to do. In, in fact, it can be really difficult to have that, that really high time and range. Now, it's important to realize that there is a relationship of A1C to time and range, where for every 10% increase in time and range, that's the percent of values between 70 and 180, there's a 0.8% reduction in A1C. And the ADA, American Diabetes Association goal for A1C is less than 7%, which correlates to a time and range goal of greater than 70%. And keep in mind that 1% represents 15 minutes in a day. So we can think about this in percentages. We can also think about this in time. So the goal for diabetes management can be to aim for more green and less red. Green being those glucose values in the 70 to 180 milligram per deciliter range, that time and range that we talked about with the goal of having 70%, which correlates to 17 hours per day. And then having less than 25% of values above 180, and less than 4% of values below 70, less than 1% below 54 milligrams per deciliter. So less than 15 minutes per day below 54. Now, again, let's step back and realize these are great goals to strive for, but diabetes management is challenging. Again, this is from Adam Brown, a science writer for Diet Tribe, where he talks about these 42 factors that affect blood glucose. It's not just food and insulin. There are a myriad of factors and these 42, honestly, are just the tip of the iceberg. I love this representation on the right that's from an article from Marissa Hilliard, my colleague at Baylor, that is an adaptation of the International Diabetes Federation's blue circle symbol. And that small white sliver that you see there represents the amount of time that you, as a person with diabetes or as a parent of a child with diabetes, spend with your diabetes care team. It's less than 0.1% of your life. Now, I took some artistic license, and I'm not a great artist, but I actually tried to do this with the children with diabetes symbol here. And I think that, that Jeff Hitchcock and you guys need to get a, a really good artist to do this. But if you can appreciate here, there's this small white sliver. It's the same adaptation. Um, and, and you as parents of little ones with diabetes are my heroes who are doing this 24-7, 365, taking care of these your, your precious children. So when it comes to time and range, it's important to really personalize it. We gotta consider a number of factors. What is your family's access to technology? Maybe the cost and coverage varies. Maybe in your state, the Medicaid program doesn't cover CGM or you have a high deductible private health insurance plan. Maybe that access to technology can be difficult. Uh, maybe there's a risk or even a fear of hypoglycemia. And, and fear of hypoglycemia can be a protective mechanism. Hypoglycemia, of course, is low blood glucose levels, low blood sugar levels. But at a certain point, it can become something that can, can be a little bit paralyzing to, to manage the diabetes to keep glucose levels in range. And so it takes some support to kind of overcome that. And it takes some time as well. What is your diabetes support system? Do you have 
other caregivers who can help you in caring for your child? Does your kid have a school nurse who's able to help them when they're at school? Um, is the coach for their baseball team aware that they have diabetes? Is their music teacher able to help support them, et cetera? And how about diabetes distress and burnout, depression? This can all affect the ability to maintain in-range glucose values. And um, these are considerations that we should think about when setting time and range goals. So those goals should be achievable. If someone has a time and range of just 20%, it may not be a re realistic to set a goal of greater than 70%. Maybe start with getting from 20 to 30 and working from there. And then finally, use supportive language, language that can help to lift up, <clears throat> empower, and inspire the person with diabetes. If you're a parent, this is a great opportunity for you to really speak life into your child, to support them, to motivate them, for recognizing that they're more than a person with diabetes, but they are an amazing, smart, creative, funny, whatever your child is, foster that and, and encourage them on their journey. And for those of you who are healthcare providers or diabetes care team members in the audience, what a gift we have to be able to support and shepherd families and to empower them um, on their journey. Now, diabetes management in 2021 has come a long way. We have incredible CGM, uh, continuous glucose monitors and insulin delivery methods. But again, we must realize that managing type one diabetes remains a 24 seven, 365 responsibility with no breaks. And that means that diabetes burden can be really significant. And hypoglycemia remains a concern, especially at night. I mean, one of the things I hear from, from the parents of young people with diabetes is that they worry about their child going low at night. And even sometimes having these really amazing glucose monitors and even remote monitoring doesn't completely allay that concern. And so the goal of diabetes technology should be to allow people with diabetes to achieve in-range glucose values while reducing the risk of hypoglycemia and removing the burden of diabetes management. And that's really where these closed loop systems that we're gonna talk about today come in. Now we have come a long way from the early prototypes in the 1960s of insulin pumps that were literally the size of a backpack to today's pumps that are small, much more user-friendly, and finally are e either have a commercially available FDA approved closed loop option or will soon in the case of the Omnipod 5 system. And we're gonna go through what each of these systems are, talk about what they sort of, how, how they operate and how you can get the most out of each of these systems. So let's talk a little bit about what closed loop systems are. They're also called automated insulin delivery systems or AID systems. You're gonna see closed loop uh, acronym um, HCL, which we'll talk about what that is. But what closed loop systems are, are three parts, a continuous glucose monitor, an insulin pump, and then a control algorithm that is able to take into account the CGM glucose values, trends, and projections to be able to safely and adeptly adjust the basal rates from the insulin pump, and in some cases, the boluses as well, towards keeping the glucose at a certain target or target range. So this is automated happening in the background without the user having to lift a finger to where it's constantly modulating the insulin in an effort to keep the glucose in range. So if the glucose is projected to be high, it's modulating up the insulin. And by contrast, if the glucose is predicted to be low, it's attenuating down or suspending the insulin in an effort to keep it in range. And it's taking into account a lot of factors. What is that person's sensitivity to insulin? Um, if they're having physical activity, this can be programmed as well. Um, the user still has to bolus for meals, but that goes into the insulin on board feature and these systems can take into account the time of day as well. Now there has been an evolving nomenclature, the language we use to describe closed loop or automated insulin delivery systems. And where we stand today, which is circled in red here, is the hybrid closed loop systems. The first models were low threshold suspend systems that all they would do is just turn off the insulin if the person was going low, um, followed by predictive low where it would shut it off in anticipation of a low glucose. To today's hybrid closed loop systems where there is automated basal and in some cases even some automated bolus insulin that's given, we'll talk about examples of that. 
But the hybrid component means that the user is still required to bolus before eating meals. So that is what a hybrid closed loop system, a future state of closed loop technology will be fully automated systems where the user doesn't even have to bolus before meals. And then what's sometimes called the artificial pancreas will be a fully automated multi-hormone system that not only has insulin, but may also have something like uh, glucagon as well for a fully automated closed loop system. And, and I am hopeful that that will happen in the next few years. So today we're gonna to focus on these hybrid closed loop or HCL systems. So this is a snapshot of an HCL system in action. This is from one of my patients actually, de-identified of course, um, so you can't see who it is. But just to orient you to this, this graph, this is the CGM glucose. This is 70 milligrams per deciliter and 180. So this is that time and range that we talk about. And what you can see is that as the glucose is rising, the basal rate shown below in purple is normally programmed at the solid line of 0.5 units per hour. But as the glucose is rising, the system is modulating up the basal. And then as the glucose is falling, it's decreasing and then suspending, shown in the shaded red reason, uh, re region, so that the glucose can actually stay in range without going too high or dropping too low. And the user is still giving boluses, which are shown here. And in some cases, there may be auto boluses by the system, which are these that are, that are blocked in black. This is a control IQ uh, algorithm. We'll, talk, we'll break that down a little bit. And the system that the, the participant can program when they are exercising so that the, the system can, can, can aim for a higher and safer glucose target in the context of that activity. So this is a snapshot of the system in action, but I'm going to break it down a little bit more as to how each of these systems work at an individual level. This is from the Control IQ Pivotal Trial, and it's really just meant to be a representation for closed loop systems in general, showing that for participants, which are shown in the shaded sort of pink uh, versus those who were not on a closed loop system, their time and range goes up really high right away. And then it's maintained over the course of six months in the case of this trial. So we see that their time and range here was at almost 90% when they're waking up in the morning, where they're waking up with the glucose value between 70 to 180. And you can see the sort of separation where those participants who were on a closed loop system had a much higher time and range compared to participants who are not on a closed loop system. And with these systems, you can achieve what I call the trifecta in diabetes outcomes, which is a lower A1C, a higher time and range with less hypoglycemia. That's not easy to do, but with these automated systems, it becomes a lot easier. Um, and I think a fourth component of this, again, I think it's really important to highlight is the reduced diabetes management burden when you have these automated systems, uh, I think that's very impactful for the person with diabetes. And these systems can be a really incredible way to start the day. Uh, I, I'm an investigator for the Omnipod 5 uh, pivotal trial. This is a participant who shared her, her picture and gave permission to share this. And you know, this is Christmas morning. And, and in some ways, as a parent with diabetes, I think you know, having your child wake up at about 100 and steady, this is all of our participants, and this is what a routine day looks like, waking up in range and steady, it feels like Christmas. I mean, it's not quite Christmas, but it is nice to be able to wake up in range. And any closed loop system is most adept at controlling the glucose levels overnight. When the person is sleeping, they're not exercising, they're not eating, and they're not bolusing. So waking up around 100 and steady is a routine. It's a norm with closed loop systems in general. So there are a lot of positives of these systems. The burden of care is lifted to a large degree. You can achieve that trifecta in diabetes outcomes. Less worry about the night. As a parent, you're able to actually sleep through the night without the constant alerts and alarms. For some of my parents who are starting on these systems, children are starting on the system for the first times, they're so used to waking up that their body is, is, is used to doing that. It's almost like having a newborn where you're just programmed to wake up multiple times at night. And the first time they sleep through the night, there's almost like this panic that sets in because they're used to waking up and checking on their child, but they realize they can actually achieve and range glucose values. You can have sleep again. It brings you so much life again. So that's a great way to get good sleep, start the day and, and have a great day as well. 
but it is not a cure for diabetes. I love the, the motto from children with diabetes that is cure today and ca uh, sorry, care today and cure tomorrow. This is a great, hybrid systems are great for the care today, but we need to still um, advocate for the, the cure tomorrow. You still have to wear a CGM and a pump with these closed-up systems. They're not yet fully automated. It, it requires some input by the user. And there are some differences for cost and coverage, depending on your insurance plan, depending on which state you live in, and a number of other factors as well. So not every uh, person with diabetes or family is able to uh, have access to these systems. So there are definitely cons to closed loop systems as well. But having said that, I love this quote from Aaron Kowalski, who's now the CEO of JDRF, who said, don't let the perfect, which is fit and forget a fully automated system, be the enemy of the good, a hybrid controlled system that still requires some human involvement as we are continuing to um, iterate on the uh, innovation of these closed-loop systems. So it's a big leap forward from yesterday's systems to today's, but I think we still have a ways to go in the future as well. One thing that can be helpful as we start to break down the different closed-loop systems that are available today is an approach for understanding the differences between systems. And Laurel Messer from the Barbara Davis Center at the University of Colorado has this really amazing CARES paradigm that can break this down a little bit. And I think this is probably most helpful for members of diabetes care teams, diabetes providers, CDCES, Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. But even as a person or a parent of a young person with diabetes, I think it can be helpful to understand how these systems work as well. So the C in the CARES paradigm stands for calculate. How do these closed loop systems calculate insulin and what is automated in those calculations? The A stands for adjust. Uh, how can the user adjust insulin doses and what parameters are fixed in the system? Revert, the R stands for revert. When does the system revert to open loop? Uh, and when should the user choose to go into open loop? For example, if they are managing sick day, should they stay in closed loop? Should they go to open loop? And that's something that you can always discuss with your di diabetes care team. The E stands for educate. What are the key and unique education points for that particular closed loop system? And then finally, the S stands for sensor. What sensor or CGM works with that, that system and what are the sharing capabilities of that system? Now, we're not gonna go through every component of the CARES paradigm for the Omnipod 5, MiniMed 670, now 770G system or, or tandem control IQ, but this is kind of a nice table that breaks it down for each of those systems. And I point you to this article from Laurel, Messel's, Laurel Messer's group uh, that was published in uh, Therapeutic Delivery uh, last year as a helpful resource and guide for this CARES paradigm. Now let's go into these different systems, describe the components, and then again, I'm gonna try to provide some very practical pearls, tips and tricks on how to use these systems to get the most out of you or your child's closed loop system. So the Medtronic MiniMed 670G is now the 770G system, which is the same algorithm, but just a different pump that is Bluetooth enabled, that has a uh, basal rate uh, modulation via this control algorithm that's actually embedded within the pump. So the pump is receiving the CGM glucose levels from the Guardian 3 sensor from Medtronic. And then based on the trends, it's aiming for a target of 120 milligrams per deciliter, and it's modulating the basal insulin to that target. The user can set a temp target of 150, for example, before exercise to aim for a higher safer glucose target uh, during that uh, activity. And this system has an adaptive algorithm that based off of previous wear, it's sort of becoming smarter over time to more adeptly and safely deliver the insulin to that target of 120 milligrams per deciliter and still does require some user involvement. So the user with the Guardian 3 sensor has to calibrate at least a couple of times per day. Sometimes the system asks for additional calibrations. This does mean that sometimes they can be exited out of auto mode into manual mode. Uh, additionally, if they are above or below uh, a limit of uh, insulin delivery, they can be ushered out of auto mode into manual mode as well. And so a few kind of tips and tricks that are specific to this Medtronic 770G system 
because it does require a bit of input from the user, sometimes I tell my patients or families who are on the system, think of it as managing your device instead of managing your diabetes. Just do that, that work to keep it in auto mode, and it's going to do a lot of the work to help to keep your child in range. Consider talking with your diabetes care team if you find that you're having high glucose values that don't come down with boluses, actually tightening the insulin action time, the insulin on board time. Um, normally, it, we use an insulin on board time for something like three or four hours, but oftentimes with my patients, I might tighten it down to as tight as two hours for patients on the 770G system. The reason for this is that when you're bolusing for a high glucose value on the system, it's only correcting you down to 150, and then auto mode takes over to try to bring it down to 120 from there. And the lived experience can feel like it's, it's not quite bringing you down as quickly. So tightening that insulin action time is sort of a smart way to get a little bit more bang for the buck with those hyperglycemia correction boluses. Now, when you're activating a temp target for exercise, you really need to do that at least 30 minutes to an hour ahead of the exercise for it to be effective and minimizing the risk for a low, especially for aerobic activity, like walking, um, playing sports that involve, that involve jogging and running, like for example, soccer. Um, and you might need to also eat some uncovered carbs, meaning carbs that you're not giving a bolus for if the glucose is less than that target of 150. Uh, and that can allow you to, to your child to have an in-range glucose value in the context of that activity. If you program tip target ahead of time and eat some carbs. Of course, this is all meant to be um, just some general pearls and talking to your diabetes care team about specific uh, approaches is going to be helpful. And then for you, looking at what the patterns and trends are, and then sort of reinforcing that the next time around to achieve and range glucose values can be helpful. Moving on to Tandem's T-Slim X2 with the Control IQ algorithm, this system has the Tandem T-Slim X2 pump, the Dexcom G6 sensor, and then the control IQ algorithm for modulating insulin delivery. And this is a, a picture of it that's shown here. So this is considered an advanced AID system because in addition to modulating basal, it can also give auto correction boluses. But let's talk a little bit about how this control IQ technology works. Don't worry about memorizing these details. We wanna provide a little bit of an overview because I think it can be informative in getting the most out of your system. And then we're gonna talk about some specific tips for the system. The control IQ is aiming for a range of 112.5 to 160 milligrams per deciliter. And as long as the glucose in 30 minutes is forecasted to be in that range, it's gonna ride the basal insulin that's programmed on the system. If it's expected to be above 160 in 30 minutes, it's gonna increase that basal insulin incrementally in an effort to keep it in that range of 112 to 160. On the other hand, if it's dropped, if it's predicted to go below 112.5, it's decreasing the basal. And if it's predicted to be to go below 70 in the next 30 minutes, it's suspending the basal insulin altogether. So that is how the control IQ technology works. And if it's predicted to be above 180, it actually gives an auto correction bolus. And we're going to break that down a little bit more. So it aims for 112.5 to 160 when control IQ is activated. So here is a glimpse of that system in action. This is the correct glucose reading in 30 minutes. It's predicted to go below 112.5. So what's happening is, is that the system is starting to attenuate down the basal insulin so that it can keep that glucose in the range of 112 to 160 and prevent hypoglycemia from occurring. On the other hand, here's an example where the current glucose is here and in 30 minutes it's projected to go above 160. So the system is modulating up the basal insulin in an effort to keep it in that range of 112 to 160. And of course, all that's happening in the background. And as I mentioned, this system also gives an automatic correction bolus. The way that it does that is it's forecasting the glucose. And if it's predicted to be above 180 in the next 30 minutes, it will give a correction dose automatically that is 60% of what normally it would give to get the glucose down to 110. And it happens without the user having to, to give any confirmation. It still beeps or vibrates like a user-initiated bolus does on this Control IQ pump or T-Slim X2 pump. And when that bolus, that automatic correction bolus is given, it does factor into the insulin on board that is shown on the home screen of this system. And the insulin on board time or insulin action time is set at five hours on Control IQ. And that 
is something you cannot modify. Unlike the 670G that we talked about before, where you can you can change that insulin action time and control IQ it's set. And that's meant to be a safety feature so that it's not stacking insulin with these automatic correction boluses, but it's still able to safely, effectively bring down the glucose levels. So that is control IQ in a nutshell. And there are a couple other features that I want to talk about, including exercise mode, which is something that the user can program. And instead of aiming for 112 to 160, it bumps that target up to 140 to 160 to aim for a safer, higher range. And again, a, a, an important clinical pearl is you want to use this like a temporary basal um, where you're actually activating it at least 30 minutes to an hour ahead of exercise. And once again, if you're below that range of 140 to 160, you may need to eat some uncovered carbohydrates uh, to have some staying power to keep the glucose levels in range in the context of that exercise. So that is exercise mode. It's programmed by the user, ideally 30 minutes to an hour ahead of exercise to keep the glucose in range um, without the risk of lows in activity. There's also something called sleep mode. And sleep mode aims for a lower and narrower target of 112.5 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. There are no auto boluses that are given during, during this sleep mode. The user can start and stop it manually by clicking on the sleep mode under the activity profile, or you could set a sleep schedule uh, and you can set up to one, uh, up to two of those. So for example, you could have a sleep schedule for weekdays and weekends where you do it, for example, from maybe like 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. or whatever the time for sleep is for your child. And as I mentioned sort of at the onset when talking about closed loop systems is that the nighttime is where these systems are most adept. And that's why you can aim for that sort of lower, narrower end range glucose value during sleep. So it can sort of allow the glucose to hum along at that glucose range while the, the person is sleeping. And this is what the system, the, the, the pump display shows when they're sleeping, uh, that, that sort of snoring symbol that we see here. Now I've been noticing something interesting in my practice, which is something that I'm calling sleepwalkers on Control IQ. And, and I'm, I'm joking here, um, but uh, I also call them sleeping beauties. And what I'm noticing is, is some of my patients who have these incredible outcomes with glucose values, in this case, an average of 122, over 90% time in range, but they're sleeping 21 and a half hours per day. Hmm, what's going on there? Um, and this is what their CGM glucose value looks like or, or, or their, uh, their, their pump download. This is 70 to 180. These glucose values are in range over 90% of the time, but sleep mode is programmed all day long. Now they're, they're not actually sleeping the whole time, but they figured out a nifty way to aim for, for, for more in range glucose values. It's just to keep sleep mode on all the time. Um, it's not for everyone, um, but for people who are really dialed in, who are bolusing consistently, who have sort of a higher time and range to begin with, uh, this can be uh, uh, a, a, an objective that, that works pretty well. So keeping sleep mode programmed. Um, what I generally do for my patients is, is I try to find out uh, when they eat their first meal of the day, and I will program sleep mode to continue until one hour after um, that meal, but usually breakfast. And then I will turn sleep mode off at that time. The reason for that is I like for the auto correction boluses to set back in an hour after eating so that if they're really high, they can get that auto correction bolus to bring them into range. Um, you know, if they undercover carbs, you forgot the bolus. And so I generally will, will program sleep mode until an hour after breakfast for most of my patients. So Omnipod 5, is that going to be the, the it, it's currently under uh, investigation by the FDA. Uh, it's expect, expected to be reviewed sometime in the last quarter of this year, so the next couple of months, and uh, be commercially available to people with diabetes sometime in the first half of 2022, depending on the timeline of that FDA review. And so currently it's an investigational device. I am an investigator, as I mentioned, in the pivotal trial. And what this system entails is a pod that actually has a control algorithm embedded within the pod. It's communicating with the Dexcom G6 transmitter, and there is the Omnipod 5 app. And the way that it works is that that algorithm, you can set a customizable glucose target of 110, 120, 130, 140, or 150 by time of day, um, and those increments of 10 milligrams per deciliter. 
And so for example, you could have a glucose target of say 130 overnight, but 110 during the day from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. The Omnipod 5 app is really just the command device where you can program auto mode, you can deliver boluses, you can view the data and change the settings. And then HypoProtect is a setting that you can program uh, similar to, to, to temp target or um, exercise mode where you're able to program a higher glucose target, in this case, 160 milligrams per deciliter uh, during times of elevated hy hypoglycemia risk like exercise. So that is the Omnipod 5 system. And already we have published the outcomes of the pivotal trial preliminary data and diabetes care in July, 2021, a number of investigators here from many different centers across the US. And we recently published a paper that is, uh, it's currently in press in clinical diabetes that was led by Carrie Brigette from the Barbara Davis Center with a, a few of us uh, from a, a number of different centers where it's really meant to be practical clinical tips for implementing the Omnipod 5 system. And so I'm just pointing, pointing those of you who are on diabetes care teams to this uh, important publication for guiding you through that. Um, so the Omnipod 5 system, again, hopefully will be available sometime in, um, in, in the first half of 2022. Now, I would be remiss if I did not really highlight the incredible work of the DIY community with the Loop DIY system that's really helped to propel diabetes device innovation and customization. And there are some important lessons from DIY Loop. So this is a snapshot of DIY Loop. And just to orient you to this, this is the CGM glucose. The system's able to project what the glu glucose is and then modulate the insulin delivery based on those projections. And it does some really smart, some, some smart features of, of this DIY Loop system. As an example, when bolusing, you still enter the number of carbs, grams of carbs that you're eating, but the user can, can select an emoji that takes into account how fast or slow those carbs are absorbed based on this lollipop being a fast absorbing carb, the taco is sort of a medium, the pizza being the slow absorbing carb that we're all very familiar with. Um, you know, pizza being sometimes an Achilles heel in diabetes management that is doable with some, some tried and true practices. Here's another smart feature of DIY Loop, the ability to bolus from a smart watch, in this case, an Apple watch. And one of my favorite uh, features of DIY Loop is the custom override, where you can set a target range, for example, in anticipation of activity. And in the case of DIY Loop, you can do it not just for right now, but you can program it ahead of time. As an example, I have a patient who is a DIY Looper and he runs cross country and he was struggling with having some lows with his runs in the morning uh, for, for cross country. And what we started doing was we would actually program his override where we would do 50% of his usual insulin at a target range of 150 to 180. And we would program that for one hour to start one hour prior to his, uh, to his workout. Uh, so we would actually, you know, he could do it the night before, but program it for the next morning and then it's able to start to attenuate down his basal. And he got to a point where he doesn't even have to ingest carbohydrates before the run because his glucose is already coming into an in-range glucose uh, that, that's at his, his exercise target. And he was able to really Im improve his, his times and, and achieve his goals with winning a district title in part based on having better diabetes control and less risk of hypoglycemia with his exercise. So a really amazing um, aspect of, of this DIY system. And the exciting news is that Tidepool has taken the data from the DIY loop community and submitted it to the FDA via this 510K pathway. And they are awaiting FDA review and, and looking to approval sometime um, in the, 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 the months ahead um, where they will actually have a Tidepool sponsored version of loop, not approved yet, as I mentioned, but sometime hopefully in 2022, it'll be there. Um, again, with the ability to, to, to do this from a smartphone and, and possibly even a smartwatch as well. Now, let's get into some tips for success in making the most out of your closed loop system. So with any closed loop system, it's still important to bolus before you eat, to really get ahead of, of that, that bolus can be important. In most cases, using the bolus calculator to enter in your carbs 
and the glucose to get the program bolus is going to be more helpful than, than just plugging in a manual bolus. Like say, you know, I, I know I need, usually need two units for this mill. I'm just plugging that in. Use your bolus calculator. The reason for that is one, the system is keeping, in the case of, of some of these systems, it's keeping in track the insulin on board, but sometimes is actually insulin on board from the basal rate modulation or the auto boluses. And so you got to really take that into account. Another thing that's nice about this is that and most of these systems, the sensor glucose will actually auto populate into the bolus calculator. So it's one less step for you. You don't have to type it in. Uh, you know, if the CGM glucose value is displayed on the bolus calculator already, all you got to do is plug in your carbs, hit give your bolus. And um, in the case of the Omnipod 5 system, it actually is taking into account not just what the current glucose is, but actually the trend when selecting what that bolus will be. So if it's trending up, it might give a little bit higher bolus, or if the glucose is trending down, it might back off a little bit. So you might think about, you know, if, if you normally are someone who overrides the bolus calculator with bolt, with closed loop systems, you might actually go with what that bolus calculator recommends because it's taking into account a number of factors. Secondly, when treating lows on closed loop systems, you may not need that typical rule of 15s where you take 15 grams of carbohydrates and recheck in 15 minutes you might require a little bit less. And the reason for that is that before a low glucose, the system is attenuating down or suspending the basal insulin. So your need for, for, for carbs is less to get the glucose to come up to a range. So I talk with my patients about a rule of four, eight or 12 grams, small discrete carbohydrates that um, depending on how low and what the insulin on board is, you might just need four or eight, 12 grams of carbs. What Stephen Ponder who wrote uh, the sugar surfing book cause a carb nudge. Uh, he has found that for him taking four grams of carbs raises his glucose by about 30 on average. So, you know, that's going to depend on how much insulin on board is. Um, it's going to depend on what your, um, activity is going to be ahead, but you can think about using smaller discrete amounts of carbs for treating lows on closed loop systems. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that with any of these systems, the position of where the pump or pod is and where the CGM sensor and transmitter is, is important so they can maintain communication with each other. And some clinical pearls, these are kind of meant more for the diabetes care team, but I'm gonna break them down in a way that, that hopefully is understandable to, to, to everybody. Um, optimizing pump settings before starting closed loop can be important um, so that you get the most out of the closed loop systems. Secondly, as the diabetes care team, it's important to still review the patterns and trends and make adjustments. And your approach to doing that is still gonna be similar to how it would be for a patient on, on any pump where you're calculating the total daily dosing units per kilo per day. You're looking at what is the percent of basal versus bolus using the rule of 500 for carb ratios and so on. Um, some technical details there, but, but the CDCES and, and providers in the audience know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, in general, with closed loop systems, you can actually tighten the insulin to carb ratio or ICR um, a little bit tighter to get a higher bolus to dampen that post mill glucose spike. Um, and the reason why you can do that is that on the back end, the system is attenuating down the basal. So you can give a little bit more bolus up front with the expectation that the system is going to be decreasing the basal if the glucose is dropping two to three to four hours later. Um, and then finally, if you're finding that on your closed loop system, you're having high glucose values that aren't coming down as, as well as you, as you think they should, they should talk to your diabetes care team, but depending on that system, you might need to tighten the correction factor. You might need to narrow that insulin action time in the case of 770G, or you might need to lower the target or target range in the case of, for example, Omnipod 5, when it comes out, um, to be able to, to get the glucose levels into a, a, a range that you desire a little bit sooner. Now, you are still wearing a CGM when you're on these closed loop systems. And I talk about the three A's of alerts. They should be actionable to where you're doing something about it. You should be avoiding alert fatigue and they should be adjusted over time. So with my patients, I generally will start with just a low alert. Then we'll add the high alert later and we'll do that high alert really high initially. And then we'll kind of narrow in to a tighter range for those low and high alerts. So we've, and the last step I do is to add the, the fall alert. And oftentimes I don't add the rise alert at all. But one thing I wanna note for close up systems, if you're using your phone and a pump, you can, in the case of a Dexcom system, at least schedule an alert schedule where you have different uh, alerts during the day versus night. 
And you might consider either turning off your alerts on your pump if you have it on the phone or just widening it so you can avoid that alert fatigue. So just think about what that is and it's gonna be different for every person and every family, but you should think about changing these alerts to finding what works best for your child, for you, for your family and for the caregivers. So a few tips for dynamic diabetes management that work with closed loop, but really just work in general is you can use CGM as a heuristic learning tool where you're seeing the cause and effect of, for example, eating or exercising and kind of course correcting based on what you see. Avoid that hypoglycemia binge that can sometimes happen when treating a low where you kind of overdo it, but also avoid stacking insulin um, where you see that you're high, and you just kind of dose and dose too much. Keep in mind that CGM can have a lag time of up to 15 minutes. So you might need to be a little bit patient when looking at the glucose trends. Um, avoid carb stacking where you're just kind of constantly grazing throughout the day. Even if you're bolusing for that, the carbs are generally faster than the insulin. So getting most of your calories at mealtime and minimizing stacking between can be helpful. Uh, be aware of glucose spikes from sugary drinks and use sugar-free drinks instead. And make sure that you're pre-meal bolusing. I talk about the rule of tens, where if the glucose is in the 100s prior to eating, try to bolus at least 10 minutes before eating. If you're in the 200s, try to bolus at least 20 minutes before eating. And if you're in the 300s, try to bolus at least 30 minutes before eating. Um, you don't have to be exact about that, but it's a nice tip to live by. I also understand that sometimes life with diabetes, life in general can be crazy. And so just getting that bolus in before eating, that's the most important thing. And I love this website from uh, Mary Ellen Phipps, who is a registered dietitian living with type one, where she talks about some tips for healthy eating with diabetes, prioritize health over body size, find joy and contentment with, it, with food, but also understand the impact that different foods have on keeping your glucose in range. Avoid rigid rules, but at the same time, try to eat a healthy diet with foods that can help to keep your glucose in range, but of course, having treats and celebrating life together with um, some delicious foods is important as well. Finding that balance is key. So I wanna talk for a second about the exciting future of diabetes technology, where we will eventually have this well-connected, digitally connected diabetes device ecosystem. And the FDA is really providing leadership and setting this bar and this platform where they have something called an integrated CGM, an ACE controller pump, and an eye controller algorithm. And the vision is that you're gonna be able to be able to eventually plug and play with different sensors or, or CGMs, different pumps and different control algorithms where you could choose from pump one, two, or three, CGM A, B, or C, algorithm X, Y, or Z, and plug and play across those platforms. And I believe that that's gonna happen increasingly in the years ahead. And imagine for, for us as, as diabetes care team members, for people with diabetes, for your parents to have that sort of choice is gonna be so huge, so important. And we're getting there. And I wanna close with what I call vision zero. And vision zero is sort of taken from the safety literature where it's this visionary target, this goal that's based on the ethical refusal to um, allow any diabetes related complications. And diabetes technology is one piece of this, but it's not a panacea, it's not a cure all. It's gonna take a coordinated approach from the entire diabetes care team, from the incredible patients and families with your voice and your platforms where we can harness everything together. Technology, exercise, nutrition, adjuvant therapy, a medical home, psychosocial support, family dynamics, resilience, type one diabetes community, what you're doing today, gathering here, to ultimately optimize glycemic control and get to a world with zero complications in diabetes. And we're not just talking about the long-term complications, but also the complication of diabetes distress and burnout. We can do this together. So um, I'm excited to be here to talk about this with you guys. I wanna close by just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of this today. Thank you to, to Children with Diabetes for your incredible leadership, for shepherding this incredible space and creating a platform like this. Uh, this picture was taken right after Hurricane Harvey, which happened in Houston a few years ago. And uh, when I rode my bike down to Texas Medical Center with my son, we saw these beautiful blue skies at Texas Children's. That was just a glimpse of the hope that we had for our city and our region. I think that's where we are right now in the diabetes space. There is so much as we celebrate 100 years since the discovery of insulin, 
there is a lot to be hopeful for as well as we look to the future of diabetes. And it's going to take us all together to get there. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. And at this point, I will open the floor for questions. So Matt, let's do it. Thank you, sir. We, I really enjoyed that. Um, so as a reminder, pop your question into the chat or the Q&A. We have had several that have come in and we'll see how many we can get through in the next nine minutes before this uh, next session starts. All right, when G7, when Dexcom G7 comes out, will all the closed loop systems continue to work with the new device? Yeah, that is a great question. And you know, in my closing slides, I mentioned this digitally connected device ecosystem and this integrated CGM category. And the Dexcon G7 is expected to have that category, which will allow it from the word go to be plugged in to another closed loop system. Now there have to be sort of like business agreements and things like that across the companies, but it is expected that that Dexcom G7 system would be able to plug into the, um, the current systems that are using a Dexcom G6. Awesome. Do you know if there are any commercial systems that are working on giving the user more control, i.e. for their target? Uh, so I mentioned the Omnipod 5 system that is expected to be commercially available in 20, sometime in 2022. And as I mentioned, with that system, you can set the target anywhere from 110 to 150 by increments of 10. So 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. And you can do that during any time of day. So that is going to be a system where you can actually change and customize the targets according to you know, what your specific needs are, um, as well as by time of day. Awesome. So for a closed loop system that prevents serious lows, is there any reason to worry about blood sugars between 60 and 70, like if you're just hovering along? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, the way that, the way that I think about lows is that a glucose less than 70 is still providing a buffer before we get to that glucose less than 54 milligrams per deciliter, which is the point at which the brain experiences low glucose. Uh, the clinical term is, is neuroglycopenia. So, um, and, and it's not just the glucose below 54 that can lead to like a severe hypo event, but it's having a, 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 a really severe uh, glucose value below that, that that usually is prolonged. So it's an important point. So having a glucose that's in the 60s, that's steady, um, for one, it's not gonna require as many carbs to raise the glucose. And it really kind of depends on, on the person, the family, your comfort levels. Um, but having a glucose, say for example, that's 68 and steady overnight, when the basal is being decreased or suspended, it's expected that it might come back up. What is the practical takeaway there? For you as a parent, as a caregiver, you might think about sort of, you know, kind of increasing or decreasing what the range of CGM low and high alerts are on your follow app so that you can get better sleep. And, you know, if it's right, set right now at 90, you may not go all the way down to 70 or 60, but you might go from 90 to 85 to 80 and just sort of over time, march to where it's comfortable for you. Uh, and so, you know, Matt, the, the short answer is it really depends on, on the situation, taking into account the hypoglycemia risk, but also the fear of hypoglycemia and the confidence that you develop over time with these systems. Awesome. So here's a good one. What have you found is a good practice for missed meal boluses with control IQ? My son sometimes boluses just after when I, when someone says, did you bolus? we sort of guess at how much to give at that point because control IQ is already working. Any better ways to manage this? That is a good question. You know, the, the obvious one is, is somehow tap into something that can, can help with that memory bank to, to do it uh, before eating. Um, a lot easier said than done. I always tell my patients, I want it to be hardwired into your frontal lobe to where when you're about to eat, at the same time, you're clicking on your pump or your, your controller to bolus as well. But I see this very often to where you forget. I mean, life on the, on the go, diabetes is hard. So um, yeah, it, what, what's important is that when you are bolusing, um, you need to look at the IOB to see has control IQ already given an automatic correction bolus. And you need to scale back the, the total bolus that you're giving for the carbs if you see that that bolus has already been given. And um, you need to take into account, I mean, it, it takes a little bit of math. So depending on your numeracy and, and your ability to do that, um, if you can think about what their bolus would have been for carb coverage based on the carb ratio, look at the IOB and then split the difference to give the amount, um, that, that is one way to do it. All right. My daughter is on the control IQ trial for five and under. We are having a hard time pre-bolusing because of the basal, sh basal shutoffs or decreases during the pre-bolus time. Which 
which then does not help the food spike. Any ideas? Yeah, so that that is a that that's an interesting point. What I see often is that um, because the systems are often attenuating down the basal prior to eating, it kind of amplifies that post meal spike. And what I find to be the most helpful at attenuating that spike, bringing that spike down, is actually giving a little bit of a bigger bolus by tightening the carb ratio a little bit. And you can do it a little bit more safely because on the back end of that bolus, on the back end of that meal, the system is once again able to kind of ramp down the basal to keep it in range. So something to talk about with your investigator if you're on that trial or with your diabetes care team, um, if you're on a closed loop system, is, is there an ability to kind of tighten the carb ratios um, to minimize the post meal spikes on closed loop systems? Awesome. For me, a target of 110 isn't going to meet my health objectives. Do you know if there are any, um, ha if there's been any talk of commercial systems letting the user define the target? Um, I, you know, it's it, because these things are close, closely regulated by um, the FDA or other regulatory authorities, um, it's kind of a safety first. And so there will eventually be commercial systems, they're going to be getting down to that target range of 100. Um, as an example, the 780G system from, from Medtronic is going to be getting there. Um, so yeah, they're, they're coming down the pipe. But in terms of that ability on a commercial system to be able to set it a lot lower than that, the same way that you could do on a DIY, I don't think that we're going to have that much latitude with a FDA approved and regulated system. Any idea when the T-Sport is coming out? I, the, it's the, the, the latest that has been shared by Tandem is, is sometime in 2022 is still the goal. You know, what's happened during COVID is that the FDA, for, for obvious reasons, has had to really put a lot of their effort and um, intensity around all things COVID, uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, et cetera. So things with diabetes and other um, spaces have kind of taken a little bit of a backseat. So that's why you're seeing across all these different platforms, some delays from what was initially projected a couple of years ago. So I'm hopeful that these things will happen, that 2022 is gonna be a year of progress and highlights, but uh, that's contingent on FDA um, timeline. I think that that's a current trend happening with everything going to the FDA right now. Um, let's see, let me see. Sorry, there's a lot popping into the chat. Um, my Android APs target is set to 75, 80 at night. This is going to be the biggest thing keeping me from adopting commercial systems. Just a comment. Let me see if there's any other. Thanks for all the discussion, everyone. This is probably the most discussion we've had during any chat so far. Um, and this is probably going to be our last question for the day. Um, hi, Dr. Dan. I'm on the 770G. Um, Consistently, 70, my A1C is hovering around 7.3 and my average BG is 158. My insulin time is 3.5 hours. I can actually achieve tighter control in manual mode, but appreciate the decrease, decreased burden auto mode provides. Can you provide any insights into bringing down that average? Also, I'm anxiously awaiting the upgrade to 780G. Can you comment on 780 versus 770? Yeah, so two things. So let's take that step by step. One is, is the first question was around um, kind of a, a practical approach to narrowing that insulin action time. If you're at three and a half now, you might start by going to three. And then with the Medtronic system, you can even do it by increments of 15 minutes. So from three to even 245, two and a half hours. I will sometimes go as tight as two hours, which I would never do with any other system, but with 770G, it's doable. Um, so that's one thing that can help. The second question was around 780G. Um, as I mentioned, there's going to be a lower target that it's aiming for. The other thing about it is that it will have auto correction boluses as well. So it's going to help to bring glucose, high glucose values down um, a little bit sooner, but still safely with that automation. Uh, Matt, thank you again. This has been yeah. awesome. I love the chat that's coming through. I could stay and talk about this all day, but I know we have another exciting, awesome speaker coming up, one of my good friends. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us today. And thanks for everyone for joining us this week. Um, please make sure you pop in our next session starting now uh, with Marissa Town, CWD's clinical director. And just as a reminder, this is our last week of our 100 Years of Us fall campaign. We need uh, like 24 more donations to get our $25,000 gift tomorrow. We just need 24 more donations of $25. And you can give now at cwd.is backslash 100 challenge. Thank you and see you in the next session. Bye. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Matt.